G'day viewers and welcome to the Fish Room Build Episode 3. So today I'll be showing you how I went from this to this. Which means we'll be drilling some tanks and I'll share with you some of my tips for saving space and money on your plumbing. And also a water chain system that will knock your socks off if it works. Which I think it will. You yeah, know, I'm pretty sure it will. So stick around and you'll find out what I'm going to use this for and also what this plastic little doohickey does and why you will want one too. And as an added bonus, you can come with me for a drive and you'll watch me risk life and limb and find out just how far I have to go to obtain a few fish for my new scape. So stay tuned for that. So we have a lot to get through, but I've sped up the boring bits to make this video as short and as interesting as I possibly can. So let's get right into it. So first off, let's drill some holes in some tanks for a few overflows. Now a lot of people are hesitant or even scared about drilling holes in glass and in their tanks. But I'm here to tell you that just like trying to spot a blind man in a nudist colony, it's not hard. Now conventional wisdom states that you can put some tape on the glass and then slowly start the hole on an angle until you get the bit to bite in and then straighten it up. But because I'm neither conventional nor wise, I end up skipping all over the place and leaving scratches everywhere. So to prevent that from happening, I've whipped up a quick jig out of some scrap timber. And not only will it hold the bit in place and stop it skipping everywhere, it can go on either side of the tank so that all of the holes on all of the tanks were the same distance from the top and the side. So that now our jig is in place, I'll use another block of timber to help clamp the jib down and it'll also catch any glass fragments and powder and stuff that might otherwise fall through the hole and put a scratch in your tank. So now that our guide is clamped down, we need to wet the glass with some water, which I have conveniently have in this sauce bottle. So the water's to keep the glass nice and cool and to stop it cracking and it'll also keep your diamond hole saw cool and means it'll last a lot longer. So without putting any downward pressure at all on the drill, slowly let the diamond bit do its work. Slow and steady is the key here. As the saw isn't really cutting, it's more grinding into a fine powder. So as I said, just go nice and steady. Don't be in a rush. Let the cutting edge do its work and just keep adding that water to keep everything nice and cool. When the hole is almost all of the way through, I personally like to remove the jig so I can see that the hole is going evenly all the way around so it's going straight and it'll go through everywhere at the same time and not leave any big chips. And there we go, done. How easy was that? So now that the hole's done, we'll remove the clamps and the timber and that bottom piece with the glass and you see all the powder and any chips that might have fallen through. So we'll keep them out of the tank. Now we just do the same thing five more times. Probably only stopping for a coffee and a toasted sandwich about halfway through for a bit of a spell. But just remember, take your time and it's not that big a drama. So this just goes to show viewers that drilling glass isn't the really big scary operation we all thought it was. If I can do it, so can you. So here we have our tanks all sitting on the rack, everything fits with the holes drilled. So I'll leave it out from the wall so we can get all the plumbing done behind it. But for now, it's time to move on to the next step. How did somebody say, fish room sink? So lucky for me, my hot water service is right outside my fish room door. So I called in a plumber and as you can see, he ran a pipe from both the hot and the cold line straight in through the wall into the fish room. So how convenient is that? This is my old laundry tub that I had to remove when I installed my eight foot tank. So I just had it laying around. So it's an ideal fish room sink. But unfortunately, because it was a little bit of an afterthought, the skirting boards are pushing it out from the wall and leaving about a three quarter of an inch gap all the way around. And viewers, this will not do. So firstly, I drilled out the pop rivets holding in the back brace, then broke out the old angle grinder, perform a bit of radical reconstructive surgery. Then I had this piece of sheet metal folded up to go over that skirting board. 
and hopefully will still be strong enough to hold a whole sink full of water. So we'll pop rivet that one into place and then we'll take the sink back inside to see how it looks. Look at that fuels, it looks like it grew there. It's hard up against the wall, there's no gap all the way around, it tucks in behind that architrave and I know it's strong enough because I was standing in it when I was installing the air loop up in the ceiling. And there's our brace up against that board and there's the patch, beautiful. And now that we have our sink installed, it's time for some plumbing. And I'm going to share with you my top four plumbing tips for a more professional job, an easier job, and maybe we can even save a few bucks along the way. Tip number one, go where the farmers go. So forget the hardware and plumbing supply stores. Go to somewhere that does irrigation parts. Their stuff is probably at least 50% cheaper than most hardware and plumbing shops. And the best part is you don't need a big hat and gum boots to shop here. Anyone can go in and the staff are really helpful because they this is all they do. They only do irrigation stuff and they'll have everything there you could possibly think of to plumb up a fish tank. Tip number two, make a miter box. If you don't have one already, make a miter box. This I just made this out of a scrap bit of timber and not only does it help hold the pipe still, it'll give you a nice perfectly straight cut every single time. Look at that. Tip number three, file those ends. So once you've made your cut, grab the file and take off all that burr and give yourself a nice chamfered curve edged. It'll make it a lot easier to slide it into your fittings. Tip number four, mark your joins. So when you dry fit everything together to make sure you're happy with it and everything's going to fit, Mark where all those joins are before you take it outside to glue it. So that way you won't get any mistakes and glue anything back to front, which, to be honest, I have done several times. So then when you put your glue on, push your fittings together, give it a bit of a twist, then line up those marks. Then you're good to go. Everything's perfect. Now this is the fill line that I made up for the tanks on the rack. So before I take it inside and make a big mess, I'll pressure test it outside. So I plug the hose in to make sure there's no leaks and everything's going to work. And another bonus tip, if you're going to get your kid to film, tell them not to put their finger over the camera lens. But now we're good to go. And now the fill line's installed on the rack. And did I have to paint it? Not really. Did I enjoy painting it? Definitely not. But I want everything that isn't a fish tank to all be painted the same colour to make the tank stand out. And while I was there, I thought I'll paint the air loop as well. So we'll touch on that. This is my air loop, called that because it has air in it and it's a big loop and it goes all the way around the room. Now this air loop is pretty straightforward. It's the same as what everyone else has. Just the loop will go around and I'll screw little stainless fittings in and then run the air lines down to the tanks. Now this is my condensation drain where any moisture that gets in hopefully will end up down in there so I can let the water back out again. And then I'm going to have my pump outside so hopefully it'll keep that room a lot quieter and I plan on using a pond pump because they're made for outside and they've got a really long cord on them. And I haven't really installed it yet because I need to get this video out because my bro Big Willie is really hanging out for some content from his favourite Northwestern Victorian small time YouTube aquarium channel. So this one's for you Big Willie. And after all that painting it felt like my hand was about to fall off at the wrist. So to do the drains I just took them outside and I hit it with a spray gun. A lot quicker and easier. For the overflows, I found these bulkheads from an aquaculture supply place because I really wanted the ones with the threads on the inside. It'll give me more options inside the tank. So we'll quickly screw that one on and these are made to have inch PVC glued inside. And an elbow glued on like that. Which presents us with two problems. The first one is it sticks out way too far. That's five inches or 12 and a half to 13 centimeters. 
And problem number two is, once that's all glued in, it can't come apart. So if you want to move that tank, you need to cut your plumbing up. And because I like to keep my options open, or I have a fear of commitment, this will not do. So I've put the bulkhead through a hole in a piece of timber, and we're going to shorten it up a bit. The lock nut is still on there, so if we damage the thread during our cut, once we unscrew that nut, it'll straighten the thread up and we'll be good to go again. So after our cut we slowly remove the nut, work it backwards and forwards to make sure we straighten up that thread. And there you go, that's how much shorter that bulkhead is now. Now to combat the second part, I want to be able to pull it apart so I can move that tank out without destroying all the plumbing. This is a slip fitting to go inside a PVC elbow or joiner but unfortunately we still can't get that collar over the top of it but we have a solution firstly I'm going to shorten it up like the other one so I can get it closer to the wall so screwed into a female piece so I don't cut my fingers off I'm going to cut about 10 mil or 3 eighths of an inch off that and as you can see it still won't fit through that collar so it's off to the bench grinder and we'll knock those edges off. There we go, now it fits through, beautiful. So we give our threaded fitting a quick file and the inside of the bulkhead a bit of a buff up just to remove that burr and make sure everything's gonna fit together nicely. Then we give it a dry fit to make sure we're good to go. Whack a bit of glue on and we're done. So now instead of having the glue and elbow on, we can screw on an inch threaded poly fitting. So this means it can all come apart and we can remove the tank. But now the big test, what's it measuring at? And you can see there it's a fraction under four inches or 10 centimeters. So we've saved an inch or about three centimeters, which doesn't sound like much, but in a fish room this small, every little bit helps. But the main reason was, if you line up that door with the rack, when I go to bring the big tanks in, if this rack stuck out past that doorway, we'd be in a lot of trouble. But now it tucks in just behind it, so we're good to go. And there's our doorway, 58 and a half centimeters out from the wall and the rack is about 57 and a half centimetres out from the wall which means we'll be able to bring a big tank in it'll be tight but it'll be doable this is a poly barbed on one end inch thread on the other end and I'll screw that into a bit of flexible drain pipe the stuff that's got the wire on the inside so the barb grabs right in behind that wire and it'll never come off in a million years and on the other end it's just a barb joiner. So we screw that one in. Threaded end into the elbow on the tank overflow. And now here's the kicker. The other end just pokes in there. That way it's not attached. So if I need to pull the tank out, I can just pull that tank and all that hose straight out. So now here we are all done. We'll quickly run through it. If I can get down, the water will come in here, up to the top through some 20 mil PVC and these are just garden poly fittings screwed in, they're threaded one end barbed on the other and that's 13 mil or half inch poly with two elbows that go up, up into the tank. So we've got the top two there, the bottom two there and the other two on the end. Now this is all made to try and hide as much as the plumbing as possible so from the front hopefully we won't see much at all. Now there's the end drain and again it overflows into there and that can pop out so we can pull that tank out anytime we like. So the overflow, the water will run down into that drain which is pretty self-explanatory then just runs downhill. 
I'll get to that T piece a little bit later, as well as that one. So then the water continues along the drain, and once it's pushed back against the wall, it'll go out and pick up the sink drain. So right about now, you could be forgiven for thinking that this is going to be just a normal automatic water chain system like everyone else has got, but it's not. The overflows are there simply because I'm Oh, where was I? The overflows are there because I'm really easily distracted. I have a very short attention span and I'm not good at multitasking. So the drains are there. Simply, if I forget and I'm not paying attention, when the water fills up, it's got somewhere to go. Because if I had a dollar for every time it overflowed a tank, let's just say I would have several dollars. And I don't want to have an automatic water change system because water here is really precious and we just can't waste it by just diluting water and using twice the water to get the same effect. So I still plan on manually draining the tanks, but I think I've worked out a way of doing it a lot easier. So that's off to the shed. This is a piece of 15 mil PVC, and I'm gonna push an end cap on the end, dry fit, and on the other end I have a threaded socket with a valve on it and then screwed into that valve is a reducing bush and an air fitting to plug the air line on. So this way we can open the tap and let a little bit of compressed air into the PVC. So now I start with the air valve off and grab the heat gun and put a bit of heat we're going to soften that pipe and bend it. Now that jar's clamped into the vice here it's just to give me the curve I want it's not really doing anything else it's not adding heat I'm only heating the pipe and I'm not going to speed this part up because it doesn't take very long at all and you can see there the pipe's getting softer 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 and then it'll bend right over and if you've ever tried to bend pipe you get the big kink in the bend so we add a little bit of air and out it pops so now I check it against the curve of the jar and I think I still need a little bit more heat. I've got a kink in one corner, so I heat a bit further along the pipe. So I'll chuck a bit more heat into it. And we'll have another go. I've still got very, very low pressure air in there. It's just enough to stop the pipe collapsing without blowing a hole in the side of it. think we're just about right there so we bend it over and have a look beautiful there's no kinks so now we'll just have to hold it there till it cools now that it's cooled look at that beautiful there's the tap no kinks at all just like it came out of the shop like that got to be happy with that and out of interest and mainly because I wanted to see what would happen I heated up a piece of scrap and I gave it full air to see what had happened. And this is about, I was about 80 to 100 psi and bang, look at that, blew the sides straight out of it. Which is why if you want to try this, keep your air pressure below 20. So I put my newly bent PVC over the side of the tank and measure, oh, not quite halfway down, which will be about 50%. So I'll put a mark in there and cut that piece off. Now what you're looking at here viewers is a bilge pump out of a boat. So if your boat begins to sink, this is how you pump the water out with one of these. It's essentially just a diaphragm pump with a handle on the top and the bottom has a valve in there. So water in that way and then out the other side. But if you want to, it's really easy to Pull it in half and you can angle that around to have those hoses facing any direction you want. So I just mount that one underneath, connect up a drain hose and the drainage is done, time for the filler. Now this is not the aftermath of the tin man stepping on a landmine, this is going to be the fill manifold. Now originally this was all going to be hidden so you couldn't see any of it and it would have been tucked in under the sink but as I get a bit older it's going to get harder to 
get down under there and operate the taps and I thought well why not make a bit of a feature out of it so I spent a little bit extra and I got the chrome plated brass fittings so I think it'll look pretty flash and I'm sealing the threads with some lock seal 5811 that way I don't need to do everything up really tight and I could leave everything pointed in the direction I want and I didn't speed this part up this is actually me working this fast And there it is all put together and looking lovely now if you've figured out what that middle part is yet just pause the video now and let us know down in the comments and if you haven't all will be revealed shortly so just be patient so i'll let the lock seal set overnight then take it outside and give it a pressure test beautiful no leaks not a drop in sight and to mount the manifold up i'm just using a couple of these little clips they're made for garden poly 19 mil or three quarter and i'll screw those up and then just use a couple of zip ties to hold everything nice and tight it should look pretty good so now time to get underneath there and connect everything up so i'll connect the supply end with a bit of flexible dishwasher hose up to our supply line on the rack and I'm going to connect both hot and cold water I'm generally not too stressed about the temperature change when you when you do a water change but because we're on tank water out here those tanks sit outside and in the middle of winter that water can get awful cold it can get below 10 degrees so that's a bit too much of a temperature drop for my liking so I thought we'll connect the hot and the cold that way we can get, at least get it fairly close. So once we get all the stuff out of there, we can hopefully test the system out. Right, our viewers, now for the moment of truth. Let's see if this works, and I'm fairly confident it will. So everybody, fingers crossed. Yes, that means you too. And let's try this out and see how we go. Okay, let's do this. Firstly, we open this valve, which will send the water up to the tanks. Now we turn our taps on. Firstly, the cold. And you'll notice there that that's lit up because that is a shower temperature gauge and it doesn't require batteries, just the water flowing through is enough to power the readout. And you see the water there is a little bit cold, so we'll turn on some hot water. And you can see that temperature coming up to where we want it. So you just set it wherever you like. Now we'll go back to the voiceover for this part because that water splashing sounds more annoying than Daniel keeping fish playing the bagpipes. So we can see there we just turn the valve to adjust the amount of water going into each tank. There they are, all the tanks filling up at the same time. How easy is that? And if you forget about it, the water just runs straight out the overflow. Simple. Now the beauty of this system, viewers, is once you've got your temperature set and you're happy with it, I can turn those tanks off and fill up a bucket and the water will be the correct temperature. Or you can plug a hose on and in conjunction with the Colin from Aussie Aquatic and pull the big fish lad approved water change device you can change water in other tanks that aren't even attached to the rack so there's the water change device right there we put it in turn on the tap and our temperatures once again already set
and away it goes. Easy. How simple is that? And then when you want to change tanks, turn that one off and just move it over to the next tank. Turn it back on and as before, temperature's already set. Oh, look at that adorable little black neon baby. Oh, isn't he gorgeous? Isn't he precious? Now, because the shower thermometer is designed for showers, not for filling fish tanks, there's a bit of a restriction and it's about 10 litres a minute or so, which is fine for the racks, but filling a big tank is going to take forever. So that's why we have that T-piece. So the temperature will still be set, but it won't be going through the gauge, so it'll get a lot bigger flow to fill bigger tanks faster. Now to be completely honest with your viewers, I think perhaps longevity may be an issue with this setup because those little taps on the end are only cistern taps. They're not made to be on and off regularly and the knobs are only plastic. And the shower thermometer itself, I'm not really sure how it's going to cope with so much water going through it once I get those big tanks because I'll probably put more water through that in 12 months than what most people would put through their share in a year so time will tell right our viewers now for the moment of truth here's our piece of pipe we folded up before with a couple of fittings on it and a little screen so we don't suck up any baby fishies that goes in there one pump and away it goes. I'll try and work in a close up so you can see that a li little bit better. But for now, let's cue the time lapse. I'll only do one half of the rack to save a bit of time and a lot of water. But that's why that PVC we bent up only goes halfway down the tank. So if I forget about it, it'll only drain half a tank. And then once we turn the taps back on, look at them all filling up nicely all at the same time. Simple. And there's our overflow. So it drains back in to all the drains we saw at the back. Then runs through under the sink, picks up the sink drain. And then runs outside. And just down in this long bit of flexible drainage hose. And out to water the lawn. Now I did say I chased up the threaded bulkheads to allow my options open. This one here is just a cheap garden poly inch elbow with an inch thread. And that just stands up there. It'll be really unobtrusive. It won't stand out at all. And the further I turn it around, the lower the tank level will be. Like, simple. Doesn't get any easier than that. Item number two is I can just screw a screen straight into it the water level will keep fairly low but at least it keeps our options open for different things we want to keep and another example is just yeah bush and a poly elbow if I can screw it in which I now have and I can screw a screen into the top of that it just whatever you want to do it's easy so now that the racks, tanks and sink are in and the water change system is in, stage one of the fish room is officially complete. Now all these other tanks are just temporary. This guy here I'm only babysitting for a mate. And that's just my whole quarantine tank with some shrimp in it. And there's my battery backup system. That'll be located outside but we'll get to that in another video. And all this will go because there'll be big tanks on that wall. So you'll have to stay tuned for that viewers. And at this point I should probably say if you like leaving likes leave a like and subscribe and comment and all those other good things the real YouTubers tell you what to do. Now viewers that's all over and done with. 
it's time for everyone's favourite part. Let's go and get some fish and see if I survive the process. Living out in the middle of nowhere like I do, I don't get to go fish shopping very often. So when I was in Adelaide the other week, and I nice and early had plenty of time, and I was coming home empty, I thought, why not sneak home the other way, and I'll go to the only fish shop I can get anywhere near and park a truck. So now I was safely parked up, it was just time to run the gauntlet and bolt across four lanes of one of the busiest roads in Adelaide. Just lucky for me I was a little bit early and I'd beat the peak hour so I didn't get run over on the way over there. But unfortunately, because I had to run and I'm not as fit as I used to be, I had to stop for a bit of a spell. And there's our destination, Aggies Aquariums. I won't take you in there today, this video is long enough and we'll leave that for another day. But I did get some fish. So here we are, carrying a box of fish and a phone to film it. Running across the four lanes again, trying not to get killed or stuck in the mud in the middle of the road. There we go, made it safe and sound without getting squashed. And there's my little babies in there. Now for those of you that bitch and moan when you've got to drive 45 minutes just to go to a fish shop, it's now half past two in the afternoon and I've fought my way out into the traffic and I'm pointing towards home. And almost three and a half hours later, I'm finally entering my own state and I've still got an hour and a half to go. Now it's been almost six hours since I boxed those fish up and walked out that fish shop door and I'm finally getting home. And after backing in and parking up for the night, I can unload my precious cargo. Now I'm not going to tell you everything I got because it's for my next scape I'm planning and it's going to be a bit of a secret and a subject for a future video perhaps. But I will show you one little guy I picked up. I saw this little guy at Aggie's last time I was there a couple of months ago and he was still there today so it was meant to be he had to come home with me. But the little fella does need a name so any suggestions fire away down below. Well I've probably bored you long enough viewers. So as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.